On this week in Enterprise Tech, we talk a little bit about law and technology. Cell networks are impeding on our privacy. And we talk with a great guest from Oracle about Dyn DNS. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 291, recorded May 18th, 2018. DNS and the edge of the cloud. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Moogsoft. Reduce IT alerts and tickets up to 99%. Visit Moogasoft.com to learn more and sign up for a demo. And by LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. Drive brand awareness, generate leads, and build long-term purposeful relationships with LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. To redeem a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit, visit LinkedIn.com slash Twyatt. And by LastPass. Join over 13 million LastPass users and start managing and securing your passwords today. Learn more at LastPass.com slash twit. Welcome to This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I am your host, Louis Moresca, your guide through the world of enterprise, but I definitely do not want to guide you by myself. I need a little help from my friends, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin, Senior Editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, you were putting some good ones up there lately at Dark Reading. I enjoyed the DARPA-funded one lately. How are you doing? Well, thank you so much. Doing great. Uh, enjoying the early onset of the monsoon season down here in Florida, but uh, using my inside time to do a lot of research on some great stories and thrilled to be here with the Twyatt Riot on a Friday afternoon. Thanks, Curtis. Of course, we, we definitely want another expert in this realm, and that's Mr. Padre S.J. Father Robert Balser, how are you doing, my friend, in your travels? Oh, well, I don't. we have no onsets right now, but I'm, I'm doing well. I'll be overseas again next week, uh, which puts me out of the show. But till then, I'm just loving California and all of the pollen. Yay. <laughs> I can hear you there. I can hear you there. Well, thanks, guys, for being here. We definitely have another great show for you today. We do a little bit of law and technology, of course, and some cell networks impeding on your privacy. And, of course, we have a great guest talking Oracle Dyn DNS. But it wouldn't be quiet without us starting with some of this week's blips. So it's the natural evolution of technology. It's released, people use it, then they use it for jokes, then people find attack services and vulnerabilities, they exploit them, then they're patched, rinse, and repeat. Well, voice assistants are no exception to this rule. Remember during the Super Bowl, Amazon had created that kill switch for Alexa devices so they wouldn't respond to people playing their commercials. Well, this latest attack takes the cake on that one. A team of Chinese and U.S. researchers have discovered a new method of attacking voice assistants by using a method called voice squatting. And no, it's not someone actually taking your office while you're out. This is actually a concept that provides an attack that tricks the user to open a malicious app by using a voice trigger that's actually similar to real apps. And it can actually then start to eavesdrop or even use phishing uh, data schemes to get data from the user. The premise of the attack is that the user would register a skill that uses a trigger phrase similar to a real app like open capital one with a W rather than open capital one command. Even though the device opens the capital one app most of the time, sometimes it will open the malicious app. Like another example would be open capital one, please. And this is an example. It reminds me of the days of trying to find a vulnerability or actually available uh, domain name out there. And this is what the apps are trying to do is they're trying to copy existing apps. The voice app there's actually another concept called the voice masquerading, which this is a whole nother attack that actually users think that the malicious app is deactivated or turned off. And then the user uses a normal command like Alexa, go home or something. And it responds as if it was that device itself. Um, this actually helps for phishing data from users and other things. With the rise of home assistants, voice assistants and smart IoT devices, this is just the beginning of the latest set of smart attacks that are entering your living room. Maybe it's time to go back to using books. Well, as Lou alluded to earlier, DARPA-funded research is trying to shorten the attacker dwell time. Now, according to most studies, the average successful attack or exploit goes unnoticed for more than six months before it's found. 
That time, which is called dwell time in the industry, is when the true damage occurs. Now, a new DARPA-funded research project called NOMON and based at Georgia Tech is applying a variety of techniques to dramatically reduce this dwell time to as little as 24 hours. Doing so takes a boatload of processing power and something called dynamic intelligence, a technique based on the dynamic modeling concept that can characterize both short-term and long-term behavior. The intelligence is then used to build behavior-based rules that figure out when a system on the network starts behaving oddly. Now, this could be a huge deal. In a recent study, over 302,000 malware domains were active for at least two weeks, and in some cases, many, many months, before the corresponding malware samples were found and could be analyzed. According to the principal investigator on Noman, the ultimate goal is to force attackers to develop ever more complex attacks and malware. Why complex? Because, as he points out, complex software is easier to find and its developers are far more likely to make a crucial and easily findable mistake. Can that dynamic intelligence software find an exploit if the exploit is actually part of of the network. Now from the, yeah, we kinda knew this was happening, but it's still a kick in the digital pouch file. Last week, Oregon Senator Roni Wyden sent an open letter to the FCC demanding an investigation into how Texas-based prison technology company Securus was able to track any phone within seconds using data from the four major carriers in the United States. The letter was prompted by the arrest of former Mississippi County Police Sheriff Corey Hutchison, who allegedly used the service to track phones of other law enforcement offices and a judge, all without a warrant. Securus call, Secure Call Platform is pitched to law enforcement with the claim that it allows them to, quote, locate individuals who abscond from justice or are missing, unquote, but evidently has no checks whatsoever to protect against unauthorized or warrantless surveillance. Securus isn't commenting on how their service actually works, but considering that their portal allows the tracking of any phone in the United States in seconds with just its phone number means that they have some form of raw data from at least AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. However, there is another level to the story, and it's the meh that this revelation has been met with in the public, with many suggesting that location tracking is already a part of life and we should just get used to it. Personally, if we're at the point that a massive violation of our constitutionally guaranteed rights to privacy and due process don't even jiggle the meter, I think we might be the problem. <laughs> so when you talk to people about Gmail and why they use it, they give you reasons like, hey, it has less spam. It actually is more, a little bit more secure for me. But nothing is bulletproof. Three weeks ago, we heard about Google's inbox spoof law that affected customers using Gmail email servers. A security researcher, Eli Gray, found a mail found a design flaw in the Google inbox app, allowing for an attacker to create a mail a, a mail to link that spoofs the recipient of an email. This means that even though the draft email might say they're sending an email to such as support at paypal.com, it could be sending an entirely different address. The only way you would know is if you inspect the mail to link or expand the to field before sending the email. An example would be you try to mail support at paypal.com in the to box, it shows that, but instead underneath it's scammer at phishing.com. Phishing Fortunately, this type of flaw is not present in Gmail or other services like Outlook directly, but as of today, Google has finally reconciled the issue weeks later, and the Google Inbox app now users no longer have that that vulnerability. They actually have an update. Darn. Um, now, unfortunately, that's has that's a background thing due to actually installed applications. You have to wait for those automatic updates. But a lesson learned: always inspect that the actual links behind the te text, especially anything you're about to click on. Well, DNS-based attacks are becoming more common and more costly. The average cost of a DNS attack in the U.S. has climbed 57% in the last year to $654,000 for 2018. The result shows that the global average cost of DNS attacks has surged to $715,000. Now, not only that, in the past 12 months, organizations faced an average of seven DNS attacks with some victims paying more than $5 million in associated costs. Now, one of the things that raises both the complexity and cost of these attacks is that DNS is both an attack vector and a target. DDoS attacks against DNS infrastructure in particular can be very costly to remediate, mainly because such attacks are asymmetric. 
In other words, an attacker can rent a DDoS botnet for a few minutes while the target has to maintain a defense and excess capacity 24 by 7 by 365. And it's getting worse. Hackers are developing sophisticated new multi-vector, multi-stage, and distributed DNS attacks. So if you were wondering when to start getting serious about DNS protection, well, now seems like a really good time. Federal officials cannot, are not allowed to, by law, endorse, campaign for, or otherwise promote a political candidate. That's one of the immutable law, rules of being a federal official with an office that will necessarily straddle administrations from different parties. That is why it was curious when FCC Commissioner Michael O'Reilly stood before the Conservative Political Action Conference earlier this year and said, quote, I think what we can do to make sure as conservatives that we elect good people to both the House, the Senate, and make sure that President Trump gets reelected, unquote. He then went on to call out the repeal of net neutrality and the loosening of regulations against monopolies in telecom as the reason why people interested in our tech future could only vote for his party. Well, the Office of Special Counsel, which handles Hatch Act complaints, reviewed his entire speech and has found him in violation of the Hatch Act. O'Reilly argued that he was only arguing for stability in government and that he didn't actually endorse President Trump, but the OSC didn't buy the excuse, instead issuing him a warning and explaining that any future violations would have, quote, considerable consequences, unquote. This is all happening as the FCC is still wavering on when and how they'll actually repeal net neutrality, which, surprise, is still the rule of the land, even though they decided to repeal it months ago. And yes, we're approaching that deadline, but we'll have to see what happens. So we've been hearing a significant amount of the 2.5 gigahertz ban and that it's unused across half the country in the United States, especially in rural areas. Well, the FCC has decided that it may be time to reclaim part of that. They put out a paper today that outlines their plans to transform, quote, transform the 2.5 gigahertz ban. What do they plan to do? Well, the new rules will propose more flexible usages of the educational broadband services or EBS spectrum. It looks as if the FCC is going to eliminate current restrictions on lease terms and outdated educational use requirements of the spectrum. This also opens the door for local expansion of networks in areas if they meet one of the three policies, one being an existing licensee in the area and want to expand their service, two, a tribal nation in the rural areas, or three, educational entity that doesn't have a 2.5 gigahertz license. If no one in the area meets these three policies or the remaining spectrum is, rem is open to the commercial use and competitive bidding, their claim is that they are essentially releasing this spectrum, quote, back to the public. It will be interesting to see if this helps the issue of coverage in places like rural areas and if it's, it puts a dent in the unused portions of the spectrum as more and more devices require the ability to be connected and more and more educational institutions want to be connected themselves. Let's hope this helps. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But first, I want to thank a sponsor supporting this week in enterprise tech and one that I can actually relate to. This is MOOCsoft AI Ops. As an engineer for over a decade in SaaS and cloud services, I can tell you from personal experience that working on the same alert and incident ticket as another engineer, especially a SEV 0 SEV A1, is a huge time waster and it can become very expensive. Ops teams end up looking into it only to find out they need to engage development, but then they call the wrong team and that team ends up looking into it. And at the same time, another dev team actually gets an alert and starts looking into it, it becomes a mess. And guess who suffers? Your customers do because they're looking, they're actually using the feature all the while you're looking into it and they run into this issue and end up creating a support ticket. So it becomes another mess. This is one of the many advantages of using MOOCsoft AI apps. It's artificial intelligence for IT operations. They have a patented noise reduction technology as well as automatic deduplication and alert ranking. No rules or filters. They manage they manage the flood alerts for you. They can literally reduce the alerts by 99%. Not only that, it integrates with just about everything. Node.js, AppDynamics, Splunk, Oracle OEM, AWS CloudWatch, Azure tools, and more. And it's extensible, which means you can easily integrate your system into it because it uses standard mechanisms like REST API, webhooks, SMP, and more. Plug your data streams into it and get it working for you. MOOCsoft is really the one-stop shop for IT and dev organizations because it analyzes, manages, and routes the fire hose of alerts to make it more manageable. This is the type of system that really is kind of a gift if you think about it. It makes it so small or large organizations can scale their service and IT business. It makes it so you can achieve full visibility across the entire technology stack with, without any blind spots. 
MOOCsoft can even look for patterns in order to provide root cause for any situ incoming situation. It can even reuse tribal knowledge automatically to help resolve issues quickly. Not that you need more proof, but you may have heard of the global IT managed service provider HCL Technologies. They include MOOCsoft AI Ops and their award-winning Dry Ice platform within their event management layer. Not only does this help organizations reduce op workflows, but it also helps reduce detect to correct time throughout the life of the incident ticket. How well does MOOCsoft work for HCL? Well, it actually helped reduce their mean time to restore by 33%. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they can support more customers with high service quality all the while using and keeping their operating costs low and their efficiency high. With MOOCsoft AI Ops, you can reduce the IT alerts and tickets by up to 99% right now. Check out the amazing system and support Twyat by visiting MOOCsoft.com to get a demo. That's MOOCsoft.com. And we thank MOOCsoft for their support in this week in Enterprise Tech cool sponsor. So let's get into the bipes. And this one actually is a pretty close one, close to home for one for me, even though I, I don't actually work in Seattle. The city of Seattle saw a problem. The cost of housing was getting high. Low, low income families couldn't afford to live in Seattle anymore. And this was causing more homeless to be on the rise. And so what 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 did they want to do? Well, they wanted to try to fix the curve of uh, the homeless problem. And what they tried to do is, well, they levied a head tax for businesses, of course. And this was a $500 per head charge for employees. It affects businesses who have $20 million of revenue per year. With some simple calculations, we can say, hey, total businesses with an average of 585 employees or more, which is around 600 businesses in the area or 3% of Seattle's businesses. This would essentially bring in an estimate of $45 million more dollars of revenue for the city each year. What Seattle doesn't realize is the issues not only do the businesses bringing a ton of employees to Seattle and driving home apartment prices up, it's also due to supply and demand. Seattle regulates heavily developers building new buildings. In fact, Seattle's commercial building code is 700 pages long. Its residential building code is also another 700 pages. Plus, get this one, affordable housing already exists in Seattle. It spends $77 million a year on the homeless, and it's unfortunate, but the current housing for homeless is abused by people because there's no restrictions on how people can live in them. There's quite a bit of uproar due to this tax. Amazon is one of the verbal ones about it. They are alone have house about 40,000 employees in the city of Seattle. And quoted from them, the city does not have a revenue problem. It has a spending efficiency problem. We are highly uncertain whether the city's council anti-business positions or its spending efficiency will change for the better. So in order to ch to play a bit of chicken with the city council, Amazon actually shut down their latest expansion of a new tower in the area that would actually bring another 7,000 jobs into the area. Basically, that's an additional $3.5 million if that head tax went into effect. This seems to have impacted the council because the final package was half that amount. So instead of $500, it was $275 a head. But the mayor wanted to essentially put it in an enforcement, what they call a five-year sunset clause on the tax. So this way, it actually goes away after five years. Chris, I want to start with you. Um, Amazon tried to play a little bit of chicken here. Will will this will this backfire? Will this this head tax backfire on the organizations and the and the companies trying to come into the area, or maybe even already in the area? You know, I don't think so because if if you look at it another way, it's it's just added to the total cost of being in a particular area. And while Seattle uh, is expensive. Uh, in reality, $275 a head is not a dramatically uh, greater cost of being there for most companies. And, and think about Silicon Valley. Uh, the cost to have an employee in Seattle is still less than the cost to have an employee in most of Silicon Valley. Uh, companies are there in, in these locations uh, for the same reason that they're in places like Manhattan not because the the cost is low to be there, but because the value is high. And as long as Seattle can maintain the mix of companies, maintain the sort of vibrant business uh, environment that has led companies to be there in the first place, then uh, I think the, the business leaders will grumble and they will push to keep those additional costs as low as possible. Um, but I can't imagine that any significant number are going to, to choose to go elsewhere. 
Right. Well, I mean, we already see Amazon looking for a second headquarters, and they're of course they're playing chicken by stopping their their buildings of new buildings and so on. Uh, in fact, we we saw that seventy percent of Seattle residents actually were against the tax, uh, and we've been even seen in the past, like for instance, Chicago actually had a head tax. I think theirs was forty eight dollars a head, and they actually got rid of it because it was hurting businesses that were coming in. And it was actually during the recession they got rid of that. So, Padre, I want to throw it over to you. Do you think that this is going to have kind of a downstream effect? You know, Amazon's going to say, well, you know what? You know, instead of hiring people in Seattle, we'll go to Bellevue. We'll go we'll go to wherever they're going to go, Atlanta or Texas, rather than bringing them into Seattle. And Seattle will start to see actually a downfall of, of expansion and, and businesses putting money back into the city. The answer is yes. And the other answer is who cares? And I say this, I'm going to go on a mini rant here, because this also strikes close to home for me because San Jose was in consideration for the second Amazon headquarters. Well, the people in the government there, they actually took a look at it and they crunched the numbers. And they said, this is table stakes for bringing a second headquarters for, for Amazon into San Jose. This is how many jobs it would create. This is how much it would cost for us to upgrade, maintain infrastructure. And this is what we look at for return of investment over the next 20, 30 years. And what they figured was, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. I mean, the, the numbers just didn't add up. Yes, it would be nice to have a very short-term increase in the number of available positions to increase employment, to, to have that political stamp to say, well, we did this, we made this happen. But they didn't want to saddle the citizens of the area with a debt 30 years down the road that they incurred now. We actually, we covered this a little bit in the story last week about Apple's data center in Ireland when it looked like a great deal, a billion dollars or more for the construction of a brand new data center. But then when the people actually started to look at what it meant for the next decade and the next decade and the next decade, they realized this is a bad deal. Uh, and there's so much of a rush to get these companies into your area that they often sweep that bad deal under the carpet because they realize by the time we get those consequences, they're going to be out of office. That's not that's not forward looking. That's bad. I, I I actually wish Seattle had stood up to Amazon more. Yes, it was scary to have Amazon stop their building projects. Yes, it was scary to have them flex their muscle. But if they're not willing to stand up to these companies and say, we will do what's best for our constituents, not necessarily for you, then you will have Amazon playing one city off on another. And nobody wins in that except for the stockholders of Amazon. Right. Yeah, I think that I think one bad thing about this is I do agree with that. I think one thing that I do don't agree with is the fact that they're trying to use this for the quote unquote for the homeless. I think they already spend a ton of money already in this area and they're not making any advances there and the, you know without legislation around that to handle that it's causing problems in fact there was an opportunity what they call the opportunity for coalition was created and they created several lawsuits against the city saying this tax is actually illegal in the state of Washington um, so of course I want to throw this over to you this seems kind of odd that the council would make up a new tax without any voters weighing in on it that could potentially hurt new businesses and then of course technology advance in the area and get away with it is is do you think this coalition is actually going too far with with like you know suing the city well um you you start getting into to a number of things my personal opinion is that uh raising the the minimum standards for the lowest of society is good for everyone now with that said i think that what we have here is a number of different agents, a number of different players, each playing their role. Um, I think it is entirely right for community leaders, for, for the, the elected officials to say, we perceive a problem. Uh, we think that a particular group, the, the group that is uh, benefiting most from being here, uh, should pay a little bit more to help resolve the problem. Um, I think it's also fine for business leaders to, to push back and try to, to lower that additional cost. It, it's part of what they do. Um, I also think that often the best thing for the, the government leaders to do is to make their case to the voters, uh, to say, we believe, we see this as the problem, and this is how it's going to benefit the entire community. Uh, yes, it seems to be a most direct benefit to this particular group. And let, let's face it, in general, people don't like the homeless. 
um, whether it's for aesthetic reasons, um, for uh, political economy reasons, uh, for ethical reasons. Uh, people don't like them because at the very least they make us feel guilty uh, when we're not there. Um, but still, they are part of our society. And simply saying, well, it's up to them to go ahead and die as quickly as possible is not uh, a, a responsible answer. So I think this is uh, a particular microcosmic look at an issue that's playing out in cities and towns all across the country. Um, and it's very interesting to see how the elected officials in Seattle are responding. Um, and I, I am quite confident that there's going to be more of this particular dance. Um, I, strong, I don't believe that the, that the group bringing the lawsuit is going to be able to, uh, to call a halt to the dance. I, I think they just become yet another of the people um, twirling around in the center of the dance floor on this particular tune. <laughs> right. I like that analogy. Yeah, I, I really hope that, uh, you know, this works out. I think they've put it into effect. We'll see uh, how businesses respond. Well, that does it for that bite, but let's jump into the next one because this is actually an interesting one as well. We, we talked a lot, a plenty about cell phone carries in the past, but this one is about a lesser known service called Location Smart. So this service identifies the location of, phone, of phones connected to AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, or Verizon with the possible accuracy of only a few hundred yards. Location Smart is meant for legitimate business uses, whatever those might be, but even its website demo can locate, locate you and just about anybody. How does it work? Well, so you don't have to try it at home. All you have to do is enter your name, email address, and phone number, and the service texts your phone and requests permission to require, query the cellular network tower closest to the device. Well, what what if you could just go around uh, the authorization policies that are required here? Well, Robert Zhao, a researcher of Carnegie Mellon, found a way. With the service knowledge of the website, Robert could look up locations without ever having a password or a credential. The service just reliably pings the tower closest to the user and bam, they know where you are. I don't know about you, but this is this is actually super creepy because who knows how many people have already used this for malicious intent, even though the location smart claims to not have leaked anything um, or intended to open the store that like the researcher found. This looks to be like another facet of leaking customer data and another dimension for discussions on how to hold companies responsible for customers' personal data. Well, Senator Rob Wyden, a Democrat senator from Oregon, wrote a letter to the FCC asking why Securus, a prison technology company, can track phones within seconds by using data they obtained from the cell carriers. How is Location Smart getting that data? Well, the carriers are, are giving them the data directly. They are partners of the carriers of Verizon and other carriers. The company boasts a, co a coverage of 95% of the country, in in including Canada. And they actually use it for, they say that businesses use it for legitimate reasons. Like, for instance, target marketing, where companies actually might want to know where their users are so they can target specific ads. Right. So let's, that's definitely their main scenario, right? So I, I guess I guess I want to go throw this over to you as Padre, I'll start with you. You know, this, this is a, this is an, they, they created this business model, they made a deal, and now they're selling this data. And, you know, they don't really care who uses it. I mean, we saw, saw prison companies using it. They even do a demo, right, on the site. In fact, I tried to do the demo, and the demo is now gone. So well, they actually got hit with that. But I'm curious to see what you guys think. Is is this something that we're going to see more and more? Is just companies, as long as they pay their money, they're going to be able to get that data? Yeah, the interesting thing about this is uh, I did a little bit of research into Securus that I did not include in the blip. And in order for them to get these partnerships that they're using to be able to generate real-time location information, they basically had to sell it as this is a tool for law enforcement. And that makes sense because if you're building a tool for law enforcement, then yes, ident uh, location uh, information should be provided as long as they provide a warrant. But the reason why they have no checks and balances for whether or not it's authorized tracking or warranted tracking is because even though they said they were building it as a tool for law enforcement, that's not how they actually built the tool. The tool was built as a portal to quickly sell location information to basically whoever will pay them. Uh, and you might imagine that the, those two goals are very, very not compatible. Um, you know, if you have 
information about someone's location, their whereabouts. And especially if you maintain historical data about their whereabouts, that is 100% a violation of your constitutionally guaranteed rights to privacy and due process in the United States. If anybody, not just law enforcement, but basically anyone who's paying for the service can now find where you are at any given time, then we have, well, a problem. And as I mentioned in the blip, the bigger problem for me is that most people don't care about this. I've seen so many people respond to this story with saying, eh, you're already giving away your location information, or of course they can do this. That's not the right response. The right response should be, we need to fix this because you are doing something illegal. Um, and that has me worried. <laughs> I, you know, me as well. I think, you know, Curse, I want to throw this to you. Like, obviously, this could have, you know, if services like this exist, this could have a substantial impact on the enterprise business. You could have companies like Google buying this. So not only can they connect you to your searches, but they can connect to where you're at. They can target you more with ads. You know, this becomes a much bigger problem, or some, but much bigger slippery slope. Uh, and later on down the road, and then you have companies that are paying for data that might take your data, siphon it, put it in their data, like Roger said, store the data, and then eventually leak that data. So, I, you know, do you think this is slippery slope? Will this impact, impact the enterprise? How, how do you think this is going to go? It's not a slippery, slippery. slope. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry, Curtis. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to say I, I'm I'm not sure it's a slippery slope, but I I do think it presents all kinds of issues, um, starting with the fact that that indeed you you have groups that that can very carefully target advertising. I mean, what what if uh, someone was using uh, SMS pushes? So that when you went by a particular store, you suddenly had ads popping up on on your phone. Well, you know, some people would find that convenient, but a lot of people would find that spooky and irritating. Uh, not to mention, for for many people who are on limited uh, cell contracts, costly. So, so there are some very real issues here, and and then you get into. Uh, even more issues. What if a company with the aims and capabilities of a Cambridge Analytica figured out that there were correlations between particular businesses and the political leanings of the people going there? Well, they could very easily start targeting uh, ads to people, uh, targeting uh, fake news to people based on where they are, based on what they, they believe they know about them just because of where they go. Uh, you're right. I think largely because of television where, you know, the, uh, the crime program of the week, if they're looking for someone, they go to, to search for the cell phone and they're able to be tracked that way. Um, I think a lot of people assume that this data has been available to law enforcement for, for years. And, uh, for better or for worse, I think most Americans feel like um, since cell phones are not a right, they are a privilege uh, that, that law enforcement has the right to have this. The, the, the problem comes in what we do with companies that are not law enforcement. Um, it gets into different rights, it gets into different expectations, and it opens up a whole conversation that we should be having about privacy but that hasn't really started yet. Yeah. You know, right. one, one of the things about the, the slippery slope argument is I, I would say it's not a slope. We're already at the bottom um, <laughs> because you may remember on Twiat about two years ago, we covered Palantir Technologies. That was one of those CIA funded think tanks that had developed a tool for what they called visualizing social media interaction. What it actually was, was a real-time location tool that could combine things like phone positioning, basically what we're seeing from Securus, along with social media content posted by those individual people. So it was, it was identifying people, knowing their exact location, and then combining it with social media information, with banking information, with withdrawals and deposits, uh, and basically everything that they could get their hands on in the public sphere. This isn't new. But I was kind of hoping that this would at least get the public to say, should should we have a conversation about how much of this data should be available? And, and yes, cell phones may not have existed when we drafted the Constitution and, and established the rights to privacy and due process. However, 
there's obviously some sort of impact that this new technology is making on those rights. We need to figure out how that fits. Um, it's it's way past time for us to have that conversation. And, um, well, I just wish we had more time to talk about it. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Hopefully that will discussion will start soon. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up is my favorite part of the show. We get to bring in our guests to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. But first, we want to thank another sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And this one is brought to you by LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. Where are all the professionals today? Well, you know. They're on LinkedIn. It's the world's largest professional network. Some of the biggest names in the industry post content there every day. I post out there jobs, interests, technology, everything. Plus, I've made some amazing professional contacts using LinkedIn. That just goes to show you that LinkedIn can really help your business. Marketing your business is all about connecting with the right audience. Advertising with LinkedIn lets you build long-term relationships with your customers. You know what happens when you establish relationships, right? It turns into high-quality leads more website traffic, and even higher brand awareness. If you think about it, there are 500 million pros on LinkedIn every day. And guess what? Those are your future customers. The advantage, the advantage LinkedIn has is it gives you the marketing tools to target your customers with laser precision down to their job title, company name, and industry. With targeting messages, customers notice and care about your message, which leads to even more trust and more rapport. That means you're reaching out to the right people and developing the right relationships. I've used them in the past, and it's amazing how fast they can scale your business's awareness all at once. Promote your business with LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. To redeem a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit, go to linkedin.com slash twiat. That's linkedin.com slash twiat for your free $100 ad credit. Terms and conditions apply, and we thank LinkedIn Marketing Solutions for their support in this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we get to get into my favorite part of the show, and this is when we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And we have a really great guest today, the VP Business and Product Strategy, Oracle Dine, Kyle York. Welcome to This Week in Enterprise Check, Kyle. Thank you for having me, Lou. Absolutely. So we, you know, we we usually give the audience a a quick journey through the guest six experience. Maybe kind of take us through your experiences and how you kind of got to to Dine uh, at Oracle. Yeah, great. So uh, I'll take you back. I actually joined um, Dyn uh, as an independent company back in 2008 when we were about 15 engineers transition, transitioning the business from what some of you might remember as DynDNS.org uh, to what we became, which was Dyn, the enterprise uh, DNS and traffic management leader that was acquired by Oracle. Uh, we announced our deal in November of 2016. And so we've been operating as a business unit inside Oracle. Uh, but also kind of broadening our value uh, to Oracle's cloud infrastructure platform and expanding our scope in product strategy as well as in R&D uh, focused on uh, edge computing and edge services as part of the cloud infrastructure platform that Oracle has been developing. My background has been entirely in cloud and uh, software as a service uh, my entire career. Uh, so that's, uh, that's all I know and uh, helping transform Oracle uh, into a cloud company. Fantastic. So you talked a little bit about it. I mean, we know we know that DNS services are, you know, they they do domain to name uh, IP translation, but Dyn is not your run of the mill DNS service, right? It drives 44, 440 billion traffic optimization decisions every day, 3,500 enterprise customers. Can you give us a little bit of insights of what kind of what is the advantage of Dyn and maybe tell us about how it affects enterprise customers? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, obviously, you guys talked a little bit about DNS as a security vul vul vulnerability uh, and also as a potential attack vector earlier. Uh, so we've been operating high SLA, uh, uh, full uh, compliance uh, suite of DNS services on a global anycasted uh, network uh, for the better part of the last decade. Uh, it's important to operate these services at high scale, uh, high reliability and high performance. So. Because of our global network and our global data sets and the amount of traffic we're running through our networks, uh, we're able to optimize a very very highly available but also very low latency uh, DNS uh, offering. 
It also is very much used, and a lot of people don't necessarily know all the DNS tricks uh, that exist out there, but you see it used a lot in disaster recovery uh, and load balancing and geographic traffic routing, and even in areas of uh, latency-based traffic steering uh, between cloud providers, between core data centers. Uh, so it's really the glue and the, in the, the, the kind of first interaction that uh, your users have with your enterprise, and we believe it's one of the most important and critical components of the infrastructure landscape. Right, so you know we you know you talked a little bit about um, Oracle's uh, infrastructure service platform platform as a service. How is how is DynDNS kind of supplementing that? What is it? What kind of value is it adding to those customers and and, and actually having it part of Oracle now? Yeah, so I mean, if you think of uh, DNS, I mean, many times you think of DNS just as either the protocol uh, or you think of it as the products. Uh, that have been productized in DNS uh, from DDI vendors all the way out to authoritative DNS providers like what we did at Dyn. Uh, I think what you need to think about when you're thinking about DNS, you actually need to think about it as common architecture and think about the things on the internet that uh, that are actually using the IP space that exists on the internet that need to be named. Uh, imagine a global cloud platform, um, obviously an infrastructure and platform, but also all the way up to the application layer. Uh, the amount of naming and complexity of the applications and workloads now running online uh, is at, a, at an all-time high as the internet continues to scale and grow. So a lot of the acquisition of Dime was really around that uh, capability of running global scale networks, uh, but also more the competency and capability of DNS and naming and routing and networking uh, brought into the overall Oracle Cloud um, strategy. So it, it's not it, it's IP, it's technology, it's capability, um, as well as product, but I think the DNS uh, and the edge services that we offer, they, they touch all, um, all components of a hybrid cloud uh, environment. Right, so you know, I used DynDNS back in the day, so I know, you know it's a great product, you know, obviously the internet landscape has changed quite a bit over the years. Now we hear things about like botnets, like the Mirai botnet. Um, we know that the attack size and has grown over over a thousand percent in the past five years, especially on IoT and edge competing. How do you think, how is Dyn going to help these changes in the internet? What's what's kind of like, what's their growth path? Where, where are they going? Yeah, so I mean... You guys talk a lot on this show about bad actors and these events that happen on the internet and that affect data uh, and data protection and data privacy, data security. I think what you're starting to see happen is uh, the internet become more and more of a war zone. Um, you know, you can literally uh, hire somebody, uh, DDoS for hire, to attack a website, uh, or you're seeing tons of BGP hijacks or uh, DNS cache poisoning events. I think what you're just starting to see is, is that there's more, any potential vulnerability that exists out there, uh, bad actors are trying to uh, you know, find those, find those uh, deficiencies and take advantage of them. And you know, providers like us and you know, other cloud providers and other networking providers and telcos, they're all trying to stay one step ahead of these bad actors. So I think that's the biggest challenge is making sure that you have the visibility into uh, into the actual uh, traffic flows in the internet, how the internet actually is connecting into your application from the outside in, uh, and also you know having the right teams uh, of experts uh, trying to get one step ahead. You hear a lot about AI and machine learning. I think that's all great. Uh, but you still need people who are uh, experts in these protocols and experts in uh, the RFCs and the way that these technologies are supposed to be working uh, to actually uh, you know, program those computers to do better AI and better ML. Right, right. So we know, you know, we talked a little bit about the the fact that edge computing is kind of on the rise, getting away from the centralized computing, these monolithic, large kind of dumb nodes and commute, more of computing edge like autonomous vehicles and augmented reality. How is this kind of changing the surface for Dyn DNS? You know, it's more of a heterogeneous environment. It's, you know, like you talked a little bit about hybrid cloud. Where is this kind of taking us when it comes to DNS? Yeah, so I mean, I actually think that's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually a segment and vertical specific discussion, right? I think at Oracle, which is predominantly enterprise customers who have been running um, legacy or, or Oracle uh, you know, database or Oracle on-premise uh, ERP or HCM over the years, you know, there's still a long way to go in enterprise cloud migration, right? It's before they're doing computing at the edge. So I think really what we've grown up in at Dyn and what we've been kind of bringing into Oracle is what, what we know and love as the cloud native or the born in the cloud or the always on uh, type of client. 
And those customers and those technologies and those innovators are absolutely uh, moving to a more distributed uh, content delivery uh, mechanism, but not necessarily in the traditional you know, CDN uh, approach of caching or uh, content delivery. You're, you're seeing folks who really want to understand end users um, all, the way, all the way down to the last mile to get a real visibility into actual performance of the end users from point to point on the internet. Uh, you're seeing a lot of centralization of, of data and a lot of the, the real intelligence of these products and these workloads inside core data centers. But you're seeing so much more get pushed out to the to the edge, into the actual uh, machines, into uh, the actual, like you said, cars or automated vehicles or Internet of Things. Uh, and especially as you move into sort of uh, manufacturing larger verticals. So for, for us, it's it's about that visibility. It's about the understanding of end user into the application workload performance, um, and then making sure that the network edge continues to grow and harden so that you can push more and more of that data um, closer and closer to customers. And again, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated thing because you know behind every application or, or website today, uh, you know there's there's hundreds uh, of objects in the most complex websites uh, serving up on that web page. So you really need to have a sophisticated um, deployment strategy and performance strategy when it relates to how, how you deploy infrastructure. Right. So you, you kind of touched on this just a little bit, like. Obviously, edge computing is going to be one of those things that's you know it's obviously coming to fruition. It's being becoming very important. How do you, how do you secure that type of thing, especially from a DNS perspective? What what are the types of things that Dyn can do to help secure that type of network? Well, first of all, you need a global scale, high capacity DNS infrastructure, right? I think the days of running your external DNF, DNS infrastructure in a single location uh, on a box uh, that on a bind server that you've been running since 1998, those days are long gone. I think the industry, especially the enterprise, has been very slow to uh, adopt DNS services, especially the DNS uh, advanced features I talked about earlier around global load balancing, around uh, uh, GSLB, uh, traffic management, latency-based routing. Uh, so I think really it's about uh, creating more education to the market on uh, the types of things you can do with DNS and that there's global multi-tenant high-scale infrastructures like, a, like an Oracle Dyn uh, that exist out there to distribute your DNS to the edge and see a lot higher performance. As you kind of move in on the rest of the edge, um, we also at Oracle are focused on web application firewall. Uh, we have our own web application firewall. We actually acquired a company uh, after Dyn uh, called ZenEdge uh, that was a web application security and DDoS mitigation provider. We've always been experts of that and protecting our own networks, but now being able to productize a bunch of that capability and bringing it out to the enterprise uh, is something that I think not a lot of um, companies are doing in a cloud um, multi-tenant environment. So once you do the DNS lookup, you ensure you have global scale on DNS. You need to make sure it's good traffic versus bad traffic coming into that application or, or coming into that network. And having the right cloud-based web application firewall and the right cloud-based distributed denial of service protection is critical uh, to protect the infrastructure regardless of who uh, is, is your compute provider or your storage provider. You need to make sure that the users actually get there and it's the right users and that it's the right performance and availability. Right. So I guess another question, we do have a, a question from the chat room, and I can see how we can kind of relate this to the Dyn DNS stuff. Uh, Digimax actually asked, does Dyn, does Dyn offer products to actually help IPv6 deployment as well? Uh, so the D and the DNS, I mean, it supports IPv6 uh, as it relates to DNS. So um, I think, you know, we've been IPv6 enabled in our DNS infrastructure. Geez, um, we're, we're one of the first, if not the first, uh, provider who enabled DNSSEC, or, or sorry, IPv6 is the question, also DNSSEC uh, inside our DNS network. I think that was back maybe 2012 or 13, um, if I remember correctly. So we support it uh, from a DNS perspective, and, and we can absolutely help. Right. So I guess when it comes to deployment, like let's say you're you're new, you have your you have your on premise environment, you're actually starting to add IoT devices to the network. Um, you know, what what is kind of the process? Maybe you can kind of walk us through the process yeah. of of getting this going and getting it set up and what you know, how to secure it, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I mean, think about your DNS server as a database of DNS records. Um, so there's something called a DNS zone file. Um, there's a couple ways to interface with our product. I mean, 
Uh, obviously, all of our services are based on REST APIs. So most companies are uh, automating and scripting to our network to push changes in uh, real time uh, out to the edge of our network. And we will propagate DNS changes um, in near real time out to our global um, our global edge to ensure that um, DNS queries are answered uh, immediately as you deploy uh, new new uh, services to the to your to your DNS network. So most customers are uh, getting up and running by giving us their zone file, by uh, writing API scripts into the network, and then automating all of the actual DNS naming as their footprint becomes more complex, more distributed, uh, more challenging to protect and defend. So it's it's a very automated thing. I think it's also worth noting. We're not sitting here telling you to throw out that uh, DNS server uh, or that DDI vendor. Uh, most of our uh, most sophisticated customers are using multiple providers, uh, and they tend to have a, a primary DNS and a secondary DNS provider or a primary primary uh, delegation set up. Uh, you can put many name servers in your global infrastructure, and we highly recommend uh, in this day and age uh, with the vulnerabilities that exist that you do just that. Got it. Thanks, Kyle. So we're, you know, we're talking with Kyle from DynDNS and Oracle. Uh, we'll get back to him after the break. We're going to talk a little bit about one of our other ads here. We we actually have a great another great sponsor, which is actually LastPass. I use LastPass multiple times per day. It's honestly one of my favorite tools. I started out using it on my desktop, then I moved it. It was so useful. I actually moved it to my mobile devices. I use it everywhere. There are too many passwords I have to remember and they're for all different sites and they're different for every site. For all my bank sites, I might use the same username, but my passwords are all different. It becomes impossible to remember and manage and you don't want to write passwords on sticky notes and you don't want to store them on plain text on your devices or even in your email. And that's where LastPass comes in and saves us all. LastPass automatically remembers and fills your passwords anytime, anywhere, whether you're on a computer or mobile device. All you have to do is remember your master password and LastPass remembers the rest for you. They have browser add-ins for Chrome, Edge, and more. Plus, it works great with Android and iOS. My family once asked me for a password for one of our bank accounts, and I had no idea what it was. All I had to do is visit the LastPass vault use one of my one and only master password, and bam, I can give them that password so they can access it. LastPass has literally saved me time. Now, I'm talking about my personal use of LastPass here, but they also have LastPass families for, my, for the entire family. Plus, LastPass also works amazing for enterprises. Just check this fact. 81% of breaches are actually caused by weak passwords. People are breaking into machines and using you as a bridge to leak data. Well, LastPass can fix this. It will protect the passwords for your entire organization. It makes password sharing easy and secure. All the sensitive data is encrypted at the device level with AES 256 bit encryption. I am definitely a LastPass user for life. I love it. At work and at home, fix your password lows with LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit today. That's lastpass.com slash twit and see which product is right for you. We thank them for supporting this week in enterprise tech. Well, we'll get back to uh, Kyle from uh, Oracle and, and Dyn DNS. But first, we also want to bring in our get our our, our co hosts in crime here. We want to talk a little bit about and maybe ask. I know that Curtis, you've you've talked a lot about DNS before. I know we talked back in the day about Quad Nine Secure DNS. Do you have any some questions or some comments about uh, about Dyn DNS? Well, uh, full disclosure. Uh, I am a Dyn DNS customer and have been for a long time. Uh, I have, have have an account with them because uh, it, it it's one of the things that I I have to keep uh, websites that I run uh, up and available to to people on the web. So I, I wanted to get that out there. Um, I'm curious, you know, talking to Kyle, you know, he he sort of mentioned. Uh, the the notion of DNSSEC. And we've had conversations here on Twiat with people like Cricket Lou of Infoblox about uh, about DNS and security. Um, recently, we had uh, a, a an incident that combined DNS and BGP vulnerabilities to... Uh, to, to enable the theft of some money from a, a crypto uh, cryptocurrency wallet. Um, and, and Kyle, I'm, I'm interested, you know, we're, we've seen attacks using DNS, we've seen attacks of DNS. 
Do you think that we are likely to see more of these blended technology attacks that, that are used just purely for financial gain? Is, is that something that you, you tend to have your eye on when you're thinking about these topics? Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, Curtis. And uh, yeah, Curtis, appreciate your business. And uh, I can remember talking to you when we were just really building Dyn's Enterprise footprint. Uh, geez, back maybe in 2009, 2010. Uh, so it's it's good to see you again. Uh, I think the security when it relates to DNS, uh, but also when it relates to these sort of protocols, internet routing uh, uh, standards, uh, I, I think I think it's a real uh, wild wild west game out there right now. And I can remember when we deployed uh, the DNS security extensions inside of our DNS network. Uh, again, I think this was back 2011. Uh, I remember the. Uh, federal government for .gov domains put out a mandate that all uh, government .gov domains needed to be signed. Uh, and you know, I think 80% of the .gov domains missed the deadline, and no one did it. Uh, and I think it's really interesting when these RFCs get written, and when AIDA put out standards, and you know, when the Dane uh, uh, re record gets created. Um, I think it's a really tricky problem for internet infrastructure practitioners. Uh, to go and deploy these services because the consumer doesn't see them uh, on the other end of the line uh, to know that these websites are being protected or that these websites are being secured. Uh, so different than the SSL or the CAs and the SSL certificates where you see the little lock in the browser, how does the end user, the consumer, or the mass market um, come to learn and trust and respect and know uh, which websites they're visiting or applications they're visiting uh, that have the best protection going. So I think it's a it's a sort of bilateral issue. If the market holistically and the end users of internet applications don't have uh, the visibility and understanding of, of security, uh, then sometimes I see that the internet practitioners, the infrastructure um, uh, owners inside corporations don't necessarily move until it's too late. Uh, and this is definitely something I think we've seen in DNS security um, in the security of the BGP. Um, we have a bunch of tooling that will actually look at um, uh, BGP routes and the BGP routing table, and they'll look at uh, DNS footprints from recursive to authoritative DNS logs. And it's shocking sometimes to sit with enterprises and show them how our outside in network and our data sets um, display their internet posture, meaning you know, what IP space do I own? Uh, what's my domain footprint? Uh, where do I have infrastructure deployed? Uh, and many CIOs in uh, kind of what I call a shadow infrastructure IT world uh, don't even necessarily know uh, the types of idle things that are sitting out there in their active network um, or, or, or the things that might have just happened in test beds or what have you. So the vulnerabilities are only compounding. And I think until, uh, I don't know what it's going to take, I think uh, until it's truly realized that these things are could affect any type of business in any vertical and end users demand security and we can score that out to the market, I'm not sure we're going to see it uh, catch up in any uh, near future, unfortunately. Right. So I wanted to actually throw it over to uh, Padre. I know he had some, uh, he was chomping at the bit there and he wanted to, to, to kind of jump in and ask some questions. Yeah, you know, I've been using Dyn for a long, long time. Even even when I was still, um, I had my own range of IPv4 addresses and I memorized which services belonged to which numbers. It, it was <laughs> it was fun to play with a DNS system that was so easy to use. I would imagine that as we've moved over to IPv6, something like Dyn, has become far more important. It's you know you can't remember an IP. You can't remember address. those. <laughs> I, I you know I can keep a couple in my wallet, but yeah, they, they get a little hard to type out. But but I'm, I was thinking with all this talk about the intelligent edge, and I love the intelligent edge, no matter which vendor is pitching it, yeah. uh, we, it. It seems like we're getting to this consensus that the best way to make the edge intelligent is to let them do what they do, and then to pull the security further into the core. So you have a dependency that's built on the service. Uh, Explain. Could you? How do you do with the elevator pitch to someone who's going to deploy ten thousand IoT devices on IPv6, and you're saying you do what you need, and we'll handle your security in our core, and that makes you part of the intelligent edge? 
Well, right. I mean, I think the naming thing is a, is a fascinating one. Uh, you must have a far better uh, memory than me. It's hard for me to remember my mother's <laughs> cell phone. Uh, so, so I think that that sophistication and that point, and I think where Oracle is coming at this from, if you think about, uh, you know, what does Oracle need to run on our cloud infrastructure platform to be around for another forty years? The Oracle database, right? So if you start with that right out of the gate and say, okay, if the Oracle database needs to move to this cloud infrastructure, we need to lift and shift these workloads to this enterprise cloud. Well, then it better be um, securely protecting that database because that's the most important thing I've got as a business. My, my business runs on that. And then if you layer that up to the ERP and the HCM, you know, these are obviously core critical business um, and talent uh, drivers for how my organization exists. So I guess my point is, is when you start there and you start to think about security and you start to think about the edge and then you start to think about the complexity you mentioned around IoT, uh, you know, these vulnerabilities in the security innate in that platform need to expand from how those core data centers and those core availability regions are deployed all the way out to the edge footprint of where the first interaction the user has or the end user or machine or the API has with those devices or with those endpoints that exist online. So that's kind of the pitch we're trying to give is that the security really from edge to core and core to edge uh, needs to be inherently um, uh, consistent throughout the entire experience. And, and for us, really trying to catch up an edge, we've been going out there trying to acquire a Dyne first, but and then the Zen Edge acquisition um, to, to ensure that we are providing not only the security inside the platform that's just part of a platform like this that's running a database or running these really important applications or workloads, but also being able to productize um, capability that actually um, will protect uh, that application and workload. Because again, we still believe it's not only going to be in our infrastructure, it's also potentially going to be on your premise or potentially running in another cloud vendor uh, and or different components of that workload are running in different locations. So. I think for us, we want to make the consistency and the edge exist so that when the hybrid cloud and then in the inherent security happen in our network fabric, but and then in the inherent world of hybrid where there's going to be multiple providers in the mix, make sure the edge is consistent to all, all customers. And so I think that's why it fits as a very strategic vehicle uh, for Oracle, um, who again is, is, is catching up in the cloud infrastructure game. Okay, I, I, Kyle, I get that, but uh, let me do a follow-up here really quickly. I, I understand... Yep why you're building your intelligent edge around an Oracle database. That absolutely makes sense to me. Yep. But I'm wondering, does that mean that all of the vendors who are pitching an intelligent edge need to customize their intelligent edge to fit their products? Because if that's the case, we're going to get into this, this scenario where the intelligent edge is really semi-intelligent edge. It may protect one product, but not another. How do we avoid fracturing the market like that? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for other providers, but I can tell you that uh, Dyn pre-acquisition, and we've held this pretty strong inside Oracle, uh, you know, we had this internal mantra called the Switzerland of the Internet. Uh, it sounds a little cliche and cheeky uh, for a show like this, but, you know, the reality was, you know, the reason that companies like Twitter uh, and like LinkedIn uh, came to Dyn as their DNS provider was for that independence and was for uh, both of our internet intelligence and our DNS and traffic management capability to have third party agnostic ability uh, to drive innovations as well as to leverage uh, the cloud providers or the um, on-premise or infrastructure technologies they had running in their captive data centers. So at Oracle, we still believe in this from an edge perspective. I think what I was trying to answer is the reason we're doing it, which you've got uh, you know, center lane, but I think you're gonna see us uh, take a very um, democratized approach to uh, how we think about um, hybrid and multi endpoint and multi provider. And I think that will be a unique and a second mover advantage for us uh, in cloud infrastructure to make sure we work nicely with Microsoft and Google and Amazon uh, when those are the providers that you choose to uh, run your compute and storage environments with. So I think it will be a little bit different. Um, I, last week at Oracle Media Day, I also teased out, um, we have the internet intelligence capability, a lot of the data sets live around, a lot of the visibility into the BGP and the internet trace, recursive authoritative DNS logs I spoke about. We're, we're actually launching in June at Velocity Conference in Santa Clara, the uh, Oracle internet weather map where we're giving countrywide and network-wide visibility 
for free to the market uh, for folks to be able to, uh, you know, look into their uh, their their networks and understand what's actually happening. And again, that can be used by any uh, consumer of any vendor. Uh, so I think you're going to see more and more of that open approach, at least from us. Uh, again, not speaking for other vendors, and I hope others follow suit. Thanks, Kyle. We're talking with Kyle York from Oracle. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. And of course, folks, you've done it again. You've wasted another hour with the best dang enterprise show according to 9 out of 10 botnets. But of course, I want to first have to thank our guest, VP of Product Strategy from Oracle, Mr. Kyle York. Thank you so much for joining us on this week at Enterprise Tech. Thank you for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. So we wanted to just give you a quick second, quick a couple moments to, to give a quick pitch about uh, Oracle and Dyne, as well as maybe tell us the audience where they can find you and all your work. Yeah, great. So thank you, everyone. Uh, so all I ask is, uh, you know, I think many of you out there are uh, consumers of Internet. Uh, you use it every single day. Uh, you rely on it. Uh, just remember every single time that you're using the Internet, uh, you're interfacing with DNS and DNS is the first interaction you have with any website, any application and any brand online in your day to day. Um, as part of Oracle, you know, we're very laser focused on building the cloud of the future for the enterprise uh, so that we ask you give us a look as you're out there evaluating providers uh, and, and starting from edge of the Internet all the way to the core. Uh, we believe we've got a really top notch solution. So we look forward to uh, uh, working with you in the future. And again, thanks, guys. Really appreciate the time today. Thanks, Kyle, for joining us on this week Enterprise Tech. Of course, folks, I have to thank my co-hosts in crime, starting with Mr. Padre SJ. Padre, thank you for being here. And of course, uh, why don't you tell the folks at home where they can find you and your work? Of course. Well, you can find me here at least for the next couple of weeks at uh, This Week in Enterprise Tech every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. Also on Know How for the next, I think, seven weeks at uh, twit.tv slash kh. Uh, we film on Thursdays at 11 o'clock in the morning Pacific time. Uh, but if you want to see what I'm doing when I'm not at Twit or what I'm doing as I'm starting to transition to my new job, you can always find me at twitter.com slash padre sj. Thanks, Padre. And of course, we can't do this show without Mr. Curtis Franklin. First, can you tell the folks at home where they can find you and your work? Well, you can find me writing pretty much every day over at darkreading.com. Uh, I've got some, some more great uh, articles coming up, I humbly say, uh, because I'm having a lot of really interesting conversations, and I try to bring those to people. Uh, follow me on Twitter at KG4GWA to find out when I'm writing and, and what I'm writing about. Um, and right now I'm doing a personal project where I'm getting ready to, to really build a, a connected home. I've uh, worked on some of these in the past, but uh, if people have ideas about uh, the products, the, the tips, the techniques, uh, shoot me a message over on, on uh, Twitter. Love to get the, uh, the thoughts and share the experience of the Twyatt Riot. New toys. Always, that's always exciting. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Every time. Well, yeah. Well, I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially thank you to Leo and Lisa who support us each and every week for This Week in Enterprise Tech. And thank you to all the engineers. Of course, thank you to Brian Chi, our tireless producer. If you have show ideas, of course, hit him up on Twitter at ADVNET Lab. He is also looking for new and interesting ideas for This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week. Of course, I also want to thank you. You tune in each and every week, and we want we couldn't do this show without you. We want to make it easy for you to watch the show and listen. Go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twyatt. You can find all the back episodes, all the show notes, guest information, the links about the show. And more importantly, next to the videos there, there's also that magic button that lets you subscribe to any format of your choice, audio, video, HD video, and the device of your choice, phone, tablet, laptop, desktop. Remember, we also do this live show each and every week at 1.30 Pacific time, live.twit.tv. And if you're joining live, you might as well check us out and come join the chat room at irc.twit.tv. The show becomes quite rich of content because of the chat room, so come and join them as well. Don't forget, you can actually follow me at twitter.com slash lumam where you can find all the cool things I'm working on from daily basis. Of course, all my work at Microsoft, you can find at dev.office.com, and that's my organization's working on. Of course, I also want to thank our TD for today. Josh, can you uh, tell the folks at home uh, what you're doing there today? Uh, well, you can uh, follow me on Instagram or Twitter. I'm 
at the Mac and Josh. T H E M A C I N J O S H. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Josh. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. And until next time, I am Louis Moresca saying if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Yeah.